Well, I have uh, a talk that has basically been 30 years worth of pr preparing for it uh, in my research. And so the title of the book is, Who is the King in America? And uh, I go through all the world's history and I bring out some points that I think you'll find fascinating tonight. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and jump into my talk. And um, history is not prophetic, but it is predictive. So uh, past behavior, Winston Churchill said, the further back you look, the further forward you're likely to see. So it gives you a trajectory. It's not prophetic, but it does, past behavior is the best indicator of future performance. So let's look back, get a trajectory. We can sort of see where things are headed. Writing was invented around 3300 BC. Sumerian cuneiform on clay tablets in the Mesopotamian Valley. Today that's Iraq. Take a stick, poke it in clay. That's the beginning of writing, 3300 BC. Here is Neil deGrasse Tyson, an astrophysicist in his Cosmos TV series. He says, it was here around 5,000 years ago between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers that we learned how to write. So writing's been around for about 5,000 years. Uh, Egyptian hieroglyphics were invented around 3000 BC. Chinese characters around 2600 BC. India's first civilizations around 2600 BC. But you round it out, there's about five or 6,000 years of records. Human beings actually writing down human records. Franklin Roosevelt said, 5,000 years of recorded history have proven that mankind has always believed in God in spite of the many abortive attempts to exile God. He uses the number 5,000. Richard Overy wrote the Times Complete History of the World, said no date appears before the start of human civilizations uh, around 5,500 years ago and the beginning of a written or pictorial history. So 6,000 years is not that long. It's only 60 people living 100 years each back to back. How many of you have met someone who's lived 100 years or close to it, maybe a grandmother? We're talking 60 grandmothers and you're all the way back to the beginning of recorded human history. It's not that long ago. But now that we have 6,000 years of records, let's look at them, what do they show? They show that there's been a 6,000 year quest to rule the world. And uh, the first story of the first civilization is Nimrod, Tower of Babel. And he, um, the Jewish commentator Josephus said, Nimrod wanted to build the tower so high that if God destroyed the world again with a flood, he could survive on top. <laughs> so it sort of had this defiant in your face attitude and God comes down, confuses the languages and the people what? Scatter. So we see this first illustration of power concentrated defiant against God and ruling over people. The story was that he made every family bring bricks and if they didn't, they would get killed. And then God confusing the languages and the people scatter and that's separated power in the hands of the people. So everyone hold up a fist in one hand and say concentrated power, concentrated power. Fingers apart with the other hand say separated power, separated power. Now back to the fist, concentrated power. Concentrated. That is world history. For most of world history, power is in the hands of the kings, Pharaoh, Caesars, Kaisers, Sultans, and Tsars. Very rarely do people get a chance to stretch the rubber band and rule themselves without a king. But in times of crises, they let the rubber band snap back. So let's look at some history. God confuses the language, languages at the Tower of Babel, but it's almost like every generation since has tried to rebuild the Tower of Babel. Only on a bigger scale, because with military advancements, you can kill more people. But um, you ever see the movie, The Terminator with Arnold Schwarzenegger? There's this killer metal robot from the future and they blow it up and they think that they're done with it, but the little pieces melt into little silvery balls and they roll together and out of it comes this hand of this Terminator, it starts chasing them again. It's like, how do you get rid of this thing? It's like, how do you get rid of this Tower of Babel? Every generation wants to try to rebuild it only on a bigger scale. And so, have you ever seen a nautilus seashell that does the little circle, little bigger circle, little bigger, bigger circle? That's a rate of geometric expansion called the golden ratio, or phi, or the Fibonacci sequence, where a number plus the previous number equals the next number, and that number plus the previous number equals the next number. It's this gradual expansion. And so it's observable in nature, in seashells, and tornadoes, and hurricane galaxies. I decided to see if it was observable chronologically with all these empires. And so I literally spent years researching every civilization that's ever existed on the planet. 
And sure enough, they seem to follow a pattern like this. So we got Nimrod, Tower of Babel, and then 2500 BC is uh, Gilgamesh, king of Uruk, or Iraq. And uh, the, uh, the oldest story ever written in any language is the epic of Gilgamesh. And you know what his first invention was? He was the first one ever to build a wall around a city. Hmm, wall, isn't that interesting? Um, and so he goes on this long journey to meet this old guy who survived the global flood. And he talks about this old guy made a boat and covered it with tar and pitch and filled it full of animals. It's the Noah story. Matter of fact, over a hundred ancient civilizations have flood stories and flood legends in their ancient past. Gee, maybe there was a flood. Well, then around 2250 BC, you have Sargon of Acadia. He conquers a bunch of walled cities from the Persian Gulf to the Mediterranean. And then you have 2,000 years of Egyptian pharaohs, and they own the people, the cattle, the land. 5,000 years of Chinese emperors. And then around 700 BC, Assyria is the biggest empire the planet had ever seen, with uh, Nineveh as their capital. And uh, then it's conquered by Babylon, which is conquered by Persia. Cyrus of Persia had the biggest empire, but it's conquered by Alexander the Great. He has the biggest empire, but he stopped going into India and they have the Gupta Empire, Chandra Gupta, and it controls a quarter of the world's population. And then Rome, right? 45 BC, Julius Caesar, and 25 BC, Augustus Caesar. It's the biggest empire that planet Earth had ever seen. Matter of fact, Augustus Caesar wanted to have a global census. He wanted to have his version of an NSA tracking. He wants to track every person under his thumb. Isn't that interesting? Dictators want to track everybody. Um, but God has a plan behind the plan because that had Mary and Joseph leave and have to go to Bethlehem to be counted in that census. But nevertheless, kings want to rule people. And then the Roman Empire is conquered by Attila the Hun around 400 AD. He has the biggest empire. Uh, then the Justinian with the Byzantine Empire, and then Islam comes along in the seventh century, conquers from the Persian Gulf to the Atlantic Ocean, all of Spain. And then the Muslims are stopped from going into France by Charles Martel, and his grandfather, a grandson, is Charlemagne. So 800 AD, Charlemagne has this huge empire. And then there's Genghis Khan in the 1200s. He has an empire that goes from Korea to Hungary to Russia. He kills 30 million people, and he has the biggest empire that planet Earth had ever seen. Then his grandson's Kublai Khan runs China. Tamerlane kills another 17 million across Central Asia. Ivan the Terrible controls Russia. 12 time zones this guy controls. And then you cross the ocean, and there's Aztec Montezuma, and he's got concentrated power, right? And then the 1500s, the king of Spain has the largest empire that planet Earth had never seen, had ever seen. And, um, and then the 1700s, the king of France has the biggest empire, Louis XIV, the sun king of France. And then the 1800s, uh, Britain ends up having the largest empire that planet Earth had ever seen. 13 million square miles and a half a billion people. All of India, Australia, New Zealand, Hong Kong, British Guyana, Canada, and America. And America's, he was a globalist. He was sort of like a one world government guy and he wanted to be the guy. And America's founders decided they didn't like this globalist king telling us what to do. And so they broke away and flipped it and made the people the king. Now power wants to concentrate. And the problem is it's in each of our DNA. And it goes back to the fall in the garden and Cain killing Abel and one king taking the kingdom from another king. And um, St. Augustine called it libido dominandi, the lust to dominate. And so that same fallen nature, Cain killing Abel, Nimrod Tower of Babel, it has a global conquest. And if these di dictators didn't die along the way, one of them would have had the whole world under their thumb by now. And, but they, they have this ultimate goal of wanting to rule the world. It's just magnified because of military advancements. Right? You got a stone, and then you got bronze weapons and iron weapons and phalanx spears the Greeks had, and then scimitar swords and gunpowder, and then finally nuclear power. If you saw the movie The Lord of the Rings, there's a line where Gandalf tells Frodo, always remember, Frodo, the ring is trying to get back to its master. It wants to be found. Power wants to concentrate. 
And it's like a pull of a magnet. It's like the law of gravity. And so you put some babies in a playpen. One of them will take the rattle from the others. And you put some kids on a playground. One of them is the bully hogging the ball. And you put some junior high girls in a clique, and one of them is the diva. <laughs> you put some natives in the woods. One of them is the Indian chief. And you put them in an inner city. One of them is a gang leader. And all a king is, is a glorified gang leader. It's a hierarchical system. If you are friends with the king, you are more equal. If you are not friends with the king, you are less equal. And if you are an enemy of the king, you're dead. It's called treason or you're a slave. And so it's this pyramid structure to society that keeps repeating itself all around the world from Nimrod to the Babylonians and the Assyrians and the Chinese and Aztec Montezuma and the king of Spain. It just keeps happening. You got the king at the top, you got his administrators and he's got his army to force his will on everybody. And then you have the peasants and the slaves at the bottom. What if you were the king? That'd be pretty nice. And then things are going along fine. But let's say you have a sister that you really love and she has a teenage son and he starts drinking and driving and partying and he hits someone with the car and kills him. And now this teenager is facing manslaughter charges, mandatory prison, and your sister comes begging to you and says, you're not going to let my little Johnny get locked away half his life, are you? What are you going to say to your sister? Well, I'll let little Johnny off the hook this time, but don't let it happen again. Guess what? As soon as you say that, you are the corrupt dictator. You just sent ripples through your kingdom that if you're family or friends with the king, you get special treatment. You're not family and friends. You don't get it. And if someone wants to point out your favoritism, you're going to be tempted to want to shut them up. And so it just happens as power concentrates. It has favoritism. It has corruption. Now, in reading through ancient civilizations, I saw three things that kept repeating themselves. One is they transitioned from hunter gatherers to agriculture. We have the Bible story of Adam and Eve plucking the fruit off the tree and then Cain was a tiller of the soil. And once group, people groups transitioned to agriculture, they needed to know when to plant the crops, which means they had to keep track of the seasons, which means they had to keep track of the stars. And so they would build big, immovable structures to observe the stars. It was like a rudimentary clock, right? So they could keep track of the seasons and them stonehead, ziggurats, pyramids. They all want to keep track of these stars. And then somebody got to climb up this building, look at the stars and come down with this secret knowledge from heaven as to when to plant the barley and when to plant the corn, and when to plant the wheat. And this person began to claim that they were the intermediary between the heavens and these commoners below. And this turned into the divine right of kings. And so you read through this ancient history, the Babylonian Assyrian kings were king priests. The Egyptian pharaohs claimed to be the son of the god Osiris. Roman emperors claimed to be divine, demanded that their image be worshiped. Chinese emperors ruled by claiming they had a mandate from heaven. Incan emperors claimed to be delegates of the sun god. The Muslim caliphs claimed to be successors of the messenger of Allah. India, their raja, their king, were a semi-divine caste of rulers. Japanese emperors were heavenly sovereigns. And then they Christianized it in Europe and called it the divine right of kings. God chose me to be the king, so whatever my will is must be God's will because he put me here. And I don't believe everybody's created equal. I believe I'm created a little extra special. And God gives all the rights to me and I dispense them to whoever I want. And so this divine right of kings is this top-down flow of power, the creator to the king to the people. And it keeps multiplying all around the world. Here's King Louis XIV, the son king of France. He said, I am the state. Talk about an ego. And then he's talking with some administrators and they say, King, you can't do this particular thing. It's illegal. He says, it is legal because I wish it. Oh, well, that's easy. The law is nothing more than the king's wishes. And he just happens to have a really powerful army to make you obey. 
Here's King James. Jamestown, remember King? He says, kings are God's lieutenants upon earth, sit upon God's throne. The king is the overlord of the whole land, master over every person, having power over the life and death of everyone. So these kings were powerful. And if you didn't believe exactly the way they did, they would kill you. And so we go through these 6,000 years of recorded human history, and we see these kings keep getting bigger and bigger because with military advancement, you can kill more people, but it's that same fallen nature of Cain, Kill, and Abel. Finally, the king of England had the biggest. Do we have kings today? Yeah, they're socialist and communist dictators. Do you know Hitler was the head of the um, uh, National Socialist Workers' Party? I think I got a slide here. And uh, so that's what Nazi stands for, National Socialist Workers' Party. He was a dictator. Uh, Stalin was, was a comrade Stalin. He was the head of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. He was a dictator. So wherever you have socialism and communism, you have a dictator. Stalin, Pol Pot, Ho Chi Minh, Castro, Mao Zedong. And then the Communist Party members are the new royalty. They're that special class. And, is, and then the people are the peasants at the bottom. And um, anyway... So at the time of our country's founding, the king of England was the most powerful king on the planet. He had this global empire of 13 million square miles and a half a billion people. It took centuries, millenniums, for our founders to get the opportunity to set up a government that was not ruled by a king. And here's James Wilson, a signer of the Declaration. He said, after a period of 6,000 years since creation, the United States exhibit to the world the first instance of a nation assembling voluntarily and deciding that system of government under which they should live. He uses the number 6,000 and something really unique happened right here. And uh, Daniel Webster, Secretary of State, says miracles do not cluster. What has happened once in 6,000 years may not happen again. Hold on to the Constitution, for if the American Constitution should fail, there will be anarchy throughout the world. For millenniums, these people say, only if we can get rid of a king and rule ourselves without a king. And we've had it. And if we fail, there's be no hope for the rest of the world. So we're going to jump into history and we're going to see how it turned into this experiment we call America. And we're going to jump in into the 1500s and we're going to see the Ottoman Empire, right? So the Muslims conquer Egypt, which used to be Christian, evangelized by Mark that wrote the gospel. The Muslims conquer Syria, which used to be Christian, evangelized by the apostle Paul. Muslims conquered North Africa. Did you know there used to be 250 Catholic dioceses along North Africa in the seventh century? And they're all wiped out by the Muslims. Why? Pi There's a movement called pietism that said, if you're really a Christian, you should give away your money and live in a cave <laughs> or join a monastery. It was their version of separation of church and state. If you're really a Christian, just focus on yourself and your own spirituality. These guys would actually build platforms in the desert, climb on top, bake in the sun, thinking they're denying their flesh and getting holier. But it was this abandonment to any, and as a result, Islam just swept right through North Africa, and then they invaded Spain and held it for 700 years, and then they conquered into Turkey, which used to be the Byzantine Christian Empire. All seven churches mentioned in the book of Revelation were wiped out by the Muslim Turks. The Christians begged the Catholic West for help. They sent help for a century or two called the Crusades. When they fizzled, the Muslims conquered Constantinople, cutting off the land routes to India. And that's when Columbus set sail looking for a sea route to India. But finally, the Muslims invade Europe and they're surrounding Vienna, Austria in 1529. And Charles V is the Catholic Holy Roman Emperor. He is the most powerful guy in the world. He controls Spain, Austria, the Netherlands, Italy. Uh, he controls all the New World. The Philippines are named after his son, King Philip of Spain. But Charles V is faced with a double dilemma. He's got a Protestant Reformation on one hand, 1517 Martin Luther. This Muslim invasion surrounding Vienna on the other hand, 1529. And so he spends a couple decades trying to stop the Muslims. He realizes he needs the Protestants' help. And so he gives a treaty in 1555, and it is called the Peace of Augsburg. It is the first treaty ever to recognize Protestants. And in this treaty is a little Latin phrase that had enormous repercussions. The phrase was cuius regio ius religio, which means whose is the reign, his is the religion. 
So in other words, look, Protestant king in Germany, believe whatever you want in your kingdom. Let's just work together against these Muslims who are invading Europe because they sort of want to kill us all. And it worked. It stopped the Islamic invasion. But in the next century, different kings believed different things. And so uh, it was one Christian denomination per country in Europe. And uh, what the king believed, the kingdom had to believe. And if you didn't believe the way your king did, you were persecuted and you fled. And so you had northern Germany and Sweden were Lutheran, Switzerland Calvinist, Scotland Presbyterian, Holland Dutch Reformed, Switzerland Calvinist, and uh, Italy, Spain, France, Austria, Poland, Ireland remained Catholic, and England was Anglican. <clears throat> now let's look at England. Um, England had a king, Henry VIII, and he um, wanted to divorce Catherine of Aragon, the daughter of Ferdinand and Isabella. And uh, she was the daughter of the king of Spain, the most powerful guy in the world. And the pope didn't want to recognize Henry's divorce, divorce of Catherine of Aragon because Charles V's army had invaded Italy and captured the pope, and he died, and this new pope doesn't want to get on the wrong side of him. And so the pope does not recognize Henry VIII's divorce. So Henry VIII decides he's going to be his own king. He starts the Church of England, puts himself on at the top, and he ends up uh, uh, having six wives. <laughs> divorced, beheaded, died, divorced, beheaded, survived. Not a nice guy to be married to. Um, his advisors suggested, I don't think I've got a slide on it here. Um, his advisors suggested if you're really serious about breaking with Rome, we should get rid of that Latin Bible, get an English Bible. All right, the Germans had Martin Luther's German Bible. That helped them to break away. Uh, Henry, you need an English Bible. So he does. He gets, uh, they basically take William Tyndall's translation called the Great Bible. They spread it all across England. It's called the Chained Bible because they actually chain it to the pulpit. Anyway, Henry dusts his hands and says, that's it. We broke from Rome. We got our own English Bible, right, whatever. They, but something unexpected happened. People began to read the Bible. Now that it's in their common English language for the first time that they, common people have access to it, they begin to compare what's in the Bible to this king divorcing and beheading his wives. And so a group starts that wants to purify the Church of England. They're nicknamed the what? Puritans. And then another group said, it's beyond hope of purifying, we're going to separate ourselves. And they would meet in secret and barns and basements by candlelight. And the king's like, look, you can believe whatever you want. I mean, you can read the Bible, but you can't believe whatever you want. Uh, you have to believe what I tell you to. So he passes the act of uniformity and of prayer. You want to say a prayer? You don't make up prayers. You read the prayer from the book. If you have five people meeting in your home and you are talking politics without approval of the king, you're all criminals. They'll bust into your house and arrest everyone. They passed a five mile act. If you are caught preaching within five miles of a town without approval of the government, you're a criminal. And they drag you before the star chamber. There's a room with stars on the ceiling, but they would twist your arm and cut off your ear and cut your nose in half and brand you on the face as a heretic for not believing the way the king did. And so this is what caused the, there was one, um, it was, his name was Thomas Hellwise. He was one of the early Baptists in England. He says, if the king can stand there on the day of judgment and answer for your conscience, fine, believe whatever the king tells you to believe. But if the king is not going to be there on the day of judgment, you are accountable to God for your own conscience. Well, you can see how kings didn't want that. They, didn't, they wanted to dictate it. Another was the, uh, the word ecclesia. And so the um, Muslims are invading Greece. Greek scholars are fleeing to Italy, and they're taking with them their Greek New Testaments. And so <coughs> for the first time, the Western scholars like Erasmus are reading the Bible in Greek, and uh, he was a friend of Martin Luther. And they began to see words they hadn't noticed before, and one was ecclesia. Ek means uh, out of, and ecclesia means a calling. And so this was a Greek word where they, for their democracy, they would call everybody out of their homes, they'd come together, and they would um, discuss what's going to happen in the city. The word politics is Greek, and it means, polis means city, like metropolis, Annapolis, Minneapolis, a polis means city. So politics is the business of the city. So they would call people out of their homes, ek, ecclesia, call them together into a body, and they would decide what's going to happen in the city. 
And um, so that's the word when Jesus says, upon this rock, I'll build my ecclesia. It's talking about the body of Christ. And the Protestant reformers use this to come up with a congregational form of church government. The king didn't like that. He wanted to keep the hierarchical form of church government because he, king, uh, uh, Henry wanted to be the head of the church. And how can you be the head of something where it's the, the body's involved? And so anyway, um, the pilgrims are separatists and they flee from England to Holland. And then Spain threatens to invade Holland and they flee again to America. And comes, uh, they tried to get permission from the king to do their little pilgrim religion in America. He said no, but they figured we're going to be 3,000 miles away. He won't notice. And so they decide to come to Jamestown, a king run colony. And they get caught in a storm. Their boat leaks, they have to come back. Their boat leaks again, they have to come back. They're killing time. They finally, it's the winter time. They're stormy and they get blown off course. They finally land on the coast of America and they're 500 miles off course. You think, oh, no problem, just sail down the coast. No, it's winter time, it's stormy, and off the coast of Cape Cod, it's really shallow. The sand goes out way far, and um, the boat almost gets stuck. It's called the graveyard of ships. Over 3,000 ships have wrecked off of Cape Cod. So the pilgrims almost sink. The captain says, it is too dangerous to do any more sailing. And he goes back to Plymouth Rock, and he says, everybody off the boat. And the pilgrims say, well, we have a question. <laughs> Who's going to be in charge? There is no king appointed person on our boat. We were going to go to Jamestown and submit to the king's government. The whole world is ruled by kings and pharaohs and Caesars and sultans. And here you are, you're telling us to get off. There's nobody that's appointed by the king. Who's going to be in charge? They do something unique. They give themselves the authority to start a government. It's called the Mayflower Compact. We, in the presence of God, Covenant ourselves together into a civil body politic to enact just and equal laws as shall be thought most meet or necessary unto which we promise all due submission. Simple, revolutionary. In the womb of this little Mayflower, in the hull of this boat, is a polarity change in the flow of power. Instead of top down ruled by a king, it's bottom up ruled by the people. It's the difference between a dead pyramid and a living tree where every root and every little capillary root sucks in nutrients to help keep this tree alive. Every citizen is needed to participate to make this thing work. It's a bottom up form of government. They take their congregational form of church government where everybody in the congregation has to be involved in the ministry. And they take it and they make it their community government where everybody has to be involved in the community. It's simple. And um, so instead of divine right of kings, it's we, the people. Now, where did the pilgrims get this idea that they could rule themselves without a king? Their pastor, John Robinson. He's like Pastor Rob. He has a faith in the public square for him. This Pastor John Robinson is the one who teaches them this form of congregational where everybody in the congregation has to be involved. And um, that painting, by the way, hangs in our U.S. Capitol Rotunda in Washington, D.C. The idea of Mayflower Compact, the word compact means covenant. And uh, the, the word commonwealth means covenant. This was studied by the reformers, John Calvin, Zwingli, Knox, Thomas Cromwell. This idea that we, the people, are in charge, but it's not this mobocracy that, that uh, Athens had. We're in a covenant with each other. And um, Pastor John Robinson, William Brewster wrote, the pilgrims are knit together as a body in covenant of the Lord, so we hold ourselves tied to care for each other's good. Later, John Winthrop comes along. He says, we are a company professing ourselves fellow members of Christ. We ought to uh, uh, count ourselves knit together by this bond of love. It is a mutual consent through a special overruling providence. We are entered into a covenant with him for this work. Uh, we must be knit together in this work. Make one another's condition our own. Rejoice together, mourn together, labor and suffer together. As members of the same body, so shall we keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. We shall find that the God of Israel is among us. The Puritan 
found, and the pilgrim founders looked back to ancient Israel. So the pilgrims are over here for 10 years. They do a good job. The Puritans decide to come over too. It's heating up in England. They're tired of getting their noses cut in half and so forth. And so there's just a couple hundred pilgrim, but there's 16,000 Puritans. It's called the Great Puritan Migration. A fifth of the wealth of England leaves. Those that didn't leave 10 years later had a civil war. But this is before that. They come across. Now, once they come across in such large numbers, they decided to institute Puritan religious uniformity. Right? In England, it was Anglican, uni Anglican uniformity. And if you didn't believe the way the king did, you were persecuted. They come across. They're happy to be across. But once they get here, they're like, you know what? Maybe it's not such a bad thing that the government tell the church how to have church because we're in charge of the government. So they begin to enforce Puritan religious uniformity. And what happens? Uh, here's Justice Black in the case of Engel versus Vital, Supreme Court case, when some of the very groups which had most strenuously opposed the established Church of England found themselves sufficiently in control of colonial governments, they passed laws making their own religion the official religion of their respective colonies. Great. Now, the non-conforming pastors have to flee again. And so you have a Reverend John Lothrop. He and his little church flee and found Barnstable, Massachusetts. And Reverend Roger Williams, he and his church flee and found Providence, Rhode Island and the First Baptist Church in America. Reverend John Wheelwright, he and his church flee and found Exeter, New Hampshire. And Reverend Thomas Hooker and his church flee and found Hartford, Connecticut. This is unique on planet Earth. At a time when you have 5,000 years of Chinese emperors, Indian Maharajas, Russian czars, Muslim sultans, African chieftains, kings of Spain, France, and Austria, here you have this little greenhouse called New England, and you have pastors and their churches forming communities, and they're doing this form of government where everybody's involved in the church work, in the ministry. This is 50 years before Europe's Age of Enlightenment. You read a secular history book, all oh, the founding fathers got all their ideas from the Age of Enlightenment. This is 50 years before that. These are non-conforming pastors, pastors fleeing the Puritans. So Reverend Thomas Hooker and his church, they flee. Do you know what they fled about? Puritans said only Puritans could vote. Thomas Hooker said anybody that's a Christian should be allowed to vote. And that was a big enough deal for Thomas Hooker to say, church, next Saturday, meet in the parking lot with your cows and wagons, and we're leaving. And they went hill and dale, found the little place, and they named it Hartford, made friends with the Indians. And um, after they're there, the church comes to the pastor and says, pastor, um, how do we do the government thing? And so he gives a sermon in 1638 titled, The Foundation of Authority is Laid Firstly in the Free Consent of the People. Again, this is revolutionary because in Europe, the foundation of authority is the creator giving the power to the king and him dispensing it as God's lieutenant. And here he's saying, no, no, it's the other way around. It's the foundation of authority is in the free consent of the people. This is reflected in our declaration with the line government from the consent of the governed. Thomas Hooker says the privilege of election belongs to the people according to the blessed will and law of God. That phrase, the people, is reflected in our Constitution. We, the people, we're giving ourselves authority for this. He goes on, they who have the power to appoint officers and magistrates, it is in their power also to set the bounds and limitations of the power. So his sermon is written down. It's called, it becomes the Constitution for Connecticut. His sermon becomes the Constitution for Connecticut. It's called the Fundamental Orders of Connecticut. They use it from 1639 up until 1818. After we become a country, Connecticut is still using Reverend Thomas Hooker's sermon. And um, that's why Connecticut's called the Constitution State. They have it on their license plate. Here is a plaque in England. Thomas Hooker, founder of the state of Connecticut, father of American democracy. Did you know that over there? They think this guy you never heard of is the father of American democracy. Here's another plaque in England. Thomas Hooker, Puritan clergyman, reputed father of American democracy. Here's a statue of Thomas Hooker holding a Bible at the Capitol grounds in Hartford, Connecticut. At the base of the statue, it says, leading his people through the wilderness. He founded Hartford. On this site, he preached the sermon, which inspired the fundamental orders. It was the first written constitution that created a government. Here's another plaque in Hartford. It says, 
uh, Thomas Hooker preached his famous sermon. The foundation of authority is laid in the free consent of the people. And then representatives of the people passed the fundamental orders of Connecticut. Here is a, what do the fundamental orders say? The people can join ourselves to be as one public state or commonwealth. Doesn't that sound like the Mayflower Compact? We covenant ourselves together to form a civil body politic. We can join ourselves. Why? To preserve the liberty and purity of the gospel of our Lord Jesus. The purpose of the government was to preserve the the liberty to preach the gospel. Here's another plaque in Hartford. They have lots of plaques in Hartford. This one says, um, Thomas Hooker's congregation established the form of government upon which the present constitution of the United States is modeled. Do you catch the significance of this? His church form of government where everybody's involved is the model for our U.S. Constitution, we the people. They even have a plaque that says this. Now the next state over, Reverend Roger Williams says, the government in this island is a popular government. That is to say, it is in the power of the body of free men orderly assembled. So in New England, instead of separation of church and state, it was the pastors and their churches that created the state. How could you say, pastor, don't get involved in politics when it's his sermon that's the Constitution? How could you say church members don't get involved in politics when all there was in Hartford was the church members? So their idea of a covenant came from Israel. It's people in covenant with each other under God. They get their rights from God and they're accountable to God. In the next century, the covenant changed the social contract. And it was people in agreement with each other, with or without God. If he's there, fine. If he's not there, fine. The next century turns into French Revolution and Marxism, and it's a social contract intentionally without God. You get your rights from the group, and you're accountable to the group. What happens is it makes the group God. And whoever gets to be the political boss, the dictator of the group, decides if you're contributing to the group, you're worth more. If you're not contributing to the group, you're voted off the island and you're killed. So, do I still have your attention? So in New England, they did an experiment that was unique on planet Earth, and they realized that the kingdom of God could not be forced from the top down. They were fleeing from Europe where kings were burning people at the stake for not believing the way the king did, and they saw in the scriptures that Jesus never forced anyone to follow him. He even says something difficult, and many disciples walked with him no more. And he turns to Peter, says, you want to go too? Peter says, where else can I go? You're the only one with the words of eternal life. Jesus was willing to let them go. And you read the context, he had just multiplied loaves and fishes and had a crowd following him for a free lunch. It's almost like he said something he knew they would have trouble understanding on purpose to shake away those that were following him for the wrong reason. It's a whole lot different than Muhammad, who said, whoever changes his Islamic religion, kill him. But since Jesus never forced anyone to follow him, we can't. And so if you cannot force the kingdom of God from the top down, how's it going to happen? Well, in New England, they thought if the majority of the people held godly values and elected representatives with their values, then laws would be passed reflecting those values and the values of the kingdom could come voluntarily percolating from the bottom up, not forcibly shoved from the top down. Does that make sense? So this is the change that happened in New England. Instead of divine right of kings, the creator gives the power to the king, and he dispenses it to the people. We go from the creator directly to each person. We sort of conveniently leave out the king. And then we are all equal, and we choose from amongst equals who's going to fix the potholes in the road, who's going to fix the bridge, who's going to defend against the Indians. This is a unique form of government. Why? Because God is a jealous God, and he wants a personal relationship with each person. He doesn't want a go-between. Right? The pastor teaches you how to have personal, you get into the word, you learn how to pray, you follow the, the, the examples of godly men and women, but you, it's your relationship, and God is jealous for that relationship. Kings always want to insert themselves in between you and God. 
like, you know, Nebuchadnezzar, when I blow my trumpet, you bow to my statue. I don't care if you have a warm feeling in your heart for my statue. <laughs> you bow or I'm going to throw you in the fiery furnace, You're right? And the king of England, you, you believe what I tell you to or I'm going to burn you at the stake. So creator directly to the people we choose from amongst equals. Calvin Coolidge said, placing every man on a plane where he acknowledged no superiors, he must inevitably choose his own rulers through a system of self-government. Calvin Coolidge goes on, the principles which went into the Declaration of Independence are found in the sermons of the early colonial clergy. They preached equality because they believed in the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. Not if you're friends with the king, you're more equal. You're not friends with the king, you're less equal. You're an enemy of the king, you're dead. No, we're all equal. And um, he says, in order that they might have freedom to express these thoughts and opportunities to put them into action, whole congregations with their pastors migrated to the colonies. So where did the pastors get the idea of people ruling themselves without a king? The Bible. Well, what part of the Bible? Well, now, when you go back in history, so yes, our founding fathers did get some ideas from the Magna Carta and the British. They did get some ideas from the Roman Republic. They did get some ideas from ancient Athens, Athens, but ultimately they got their ideas from ancient Israel. These New England pastors got their ideas from the Bible. Now, you say, Bill, can you prove it? I found this interesting. So our U.S. Constitution was written. All right, the Constitutional Convention, and you got James Madison, and everybody's there, they write it, but it has to be approved and ratified by nine states before it went into effect. They had eight, and New Hampshire was in line to be the ninth, but they were having arguments and about to vote against it. And so Harvard President Samuel Langdon is there at the New Hampshire Ratifying Convention, and he gives an address titled, The Republic of the Israelites, an example to the American states. Instead of the 12 tribes of Israel, we may substitute the 13 states of the American Union and see this application plainly. After his address, they vote, they ratify it, and our U.S. Constitution goes into effect. Our U.S. Constitution went into effect after the sermon, the Republic of the Israelites, an example to the American states. What was the Republic of the Israelites? It was the first 400 years when they came out of Egypt before they got King Saul. This, in the years I spent reading through history, ancient Israel, when they came out of Egypt around 1400 BC, they came into the promised land for 400 years, they did not have a king. This was the first instance in recorded history of a nation with millions of people and no king. I mean, here they go from 400 years of slavery and they get downloaded this, this most unique form of government. And so their form of government, everyone was equal. There is no respect of persons in judgment. Rich or poor, everyone's the same. Male, female, made in the image of the creator. Even the stranger living amongst you is under the same law that you're under. This was revolutionary because wherever there's a king, if you're friends with the king, you're more equal. If you're not friends with the king, you're less equal. You're enemy of the king. Ancient Israel is the beginning of the concept of equality that everyone you see is equal to you. There, there's no royal family somewhere that everybody's trying to butter up next to. Israel came up with this idea of tolerance. Here they were worshiping the one true God and they never felt compelled to force anyone to worship the one true God. Get your lamb, you come to the temple. No, they realize it's only of value to God if it's freely given. Israel was the first nation with private land ownership. Wherever there's a king, you never really own the land. It's always dependent of you staying on the nice side of the king. You cross the king, he will take away the land and kill you. In Israel, the land was permanently titled to each family. If they got in a pinch and sold it, every 50 years, the land reverted back to that family. This prevented a dictator from gathering up the land and putting the people back into slavery. Now, if you own land, you can accumulate stuff. The Bible called that being blessed. Karl Marx called it being a capitalist. <laughs> you got stuff, you worked hard, you saved it. So it's called the promised land because the family's got title to the land. Israel had no police. Everyone was taught the law. Everyone helped enforce the law. It's like everybody was deputized. If you heard somebody taking God's name in vain, it's your job to go to tell the elders, right? So in Israel, there were no police. 
It was sort of like traffic laws today. Somebody's weaving in and out of the lanes. You take it upon yourself to honk the horn. Uh, you know, at, or maybe a mom watching a bunch of neighborhood kids. She has no problem correcting somebody else's kid. In Israel, everybody corrected everybody else. Uh, Israel had no standing army. You have a king, he has an army to enforce his will. In Israel, every man was in the militia and armed with a sword upon their thigh, and they were ready at a moment's notice to defend their family and their community. Israel had no prisons. Remember Joseph in Egypt was in prison for several years? In Israel, when a crime was committed, you got the elders of the city together and you brought the accused and you had the trial immediately. And of course, there was a city of refuge that you could run away to to await a trial. Israel had a bureaucracy-free welfare system. What's that? Remember in Egypt, people were selling their souls to the Pharaoh for a bag of grain? In Israel... When somebody harvested their field, they left the gleanings, the corners for the poor people to pick through like Ruth. This way, the poor were taken care of and they did something so they kept their self-esteem without some political leader collecting everything and doling it back out to those who can help them stay in power. Israel had a system of honesty. God hates unjust weights and measures. This became the basis for commerce. You could trust people. And Israel got to choose their own leaders. Moses spake unto the children of Israel, how can I myself alone bear your burden? Take you wise men and understanding and known among your tribes, and I'll make them rulers over you. This was an election process within each little village and every little city and every little town. They would elect their elders. And then the elders would send somebody to the tribal meeting, and the tribe would send somebody to the Hebrew Sanhedrin, their Hebrew Senate. It was not some king appointing them all. It was the people. Moses says, take you, known among you. You know who is the, the right person that hates covetousness. So in ancient Israel, anyone could be raised up into leadership. Here's Gideon from a nobody family, becomes a leader. Here's Deborah, a woman, becomes a national leader. Not because she's related to a king or a pharaoh. She knows the law. She's honest. She sits under a tree. People make their way all the way across the country to have her hear their case, and she tells them what the law says. Where else in the world could a woman become a national leader who's not related to royalty? It's just her. Harvard President Samuel Langdon finishes his address. The Israelites may be considered as a pattern to the world in all ages of government on Republican principles. From abject slavery, a mere mob, to a well-regulated nation under laws far superior to what any other nation could boast. Think of it. They go from 400 years of slavery, they can't even read, and suddenly they get downloaded, this most unique form of government. It's so totally opposite human nature, where you got this selfishness and everything. There's no other way of explaining it than it had to be God. And then... Israel was the first nation that could read. So Sumerian cuneiform. Did you know that there were 1,500 cuneiform characters? I don't know about you, but memorizing 1,500 anything is not fun. So the first invention ever was the plow. Cain was a tiller of the soil. Then people started hitting each other with it. They turned into weapons. And then people felt insecure. They gathered together for protection. And when you get people together, somebody's a little better at knowing how to fight than the rest. And we say, you be our captain. And he organizes you, and you fight, and you, you win, and you live. That is a good thing. But then this captain has kids and grandkids who claim to be an elite class. Well, my granddad's the one we're all indebted to. And before you know it, you got a political boss. And before you know it, you got his, his gang leader. And before you know it, you got a king. And he claims to own everything in town, and he wants to count it. So writing started as an accounting method for kings to keep track of everything. China, they wrote with not, they counted with knots and ropes. And then they had an abacus, rods with beads, and then little tokens and dishes, and then they made markings on the tokens, like tallying one, two, three, four, line across for five. That was the beginning of writing. Sumeria had 1,500 cuneiform, really complicated. Egypt had 3,000 hieroglyphs. Only 1% of Egypt could read. Reading and writing was the scribes' secret knowledge. 
They kept it complicated on purpose as job security. They were needed to interpret it. China had 10,000 characters only for court records. Only the upper class could read. It was the communication of the deep state. The common people were kept ignorant and in the dark. And so anthropologist Claude Levi Strauss, ancient writings main function was to facilitate the enslavement of other human beings. So when Moses comes down the mountain, he did not just have the law. He had the law in 22 characters. First character is Aleph, second letter Beth. Sounds familiar? It's so easy to learn, kids can learn it. No longer is reading and writing the secret knowledge of this ruling class, everybody can read. Israel's the first instance of an educated populace. For the people to rule themselves, they need to be educated and they need to learn how to read. So the priest taught them the law, but the priest taught them how to read the law. Harry S. Truman said, the fundamental basis of this nation's laws was given to Moses on the Mount. So, if you think of power as that spectrum, right, with the fist on one hand, total government, open finger on the other hand, no government, the, the king rules through fear. You do what he says or he kills you. The no government side, that would be anarchy. No government, unless each person is taught the law. It's like everybody downloads a behavioral app on their iPhone. Instead of a GPS telling you where to turn, it tells you how to act, right? It's, it's a behavioral app. Now, don't steal that, don't lie to that person, don't hit this person, don't yell, right? Everybody's got the app, and the Levites are the computer geeks that help you to download the app, right? Press this button here, memorize this verse, line upon line, precept upon precept, right? And so in Israel, they take the power of the king, the people rule, but the people need to be educated, and they need to be taught the, the law, this internal moral app. But wait a second, why would you follow it? What would motivate you to follow an internal moral? Well, ancient Israel had the key ingredient. There is a God who is watching everyone. He wants you to be fair, and he's gonna hold you accountable in the future. So you're about to steal something, nobody's around, you know you can get away with it, and then you think, uh, God is watching me, he wants me to be fair, he's gonna hold me accountable. Mm, maybe I should hesitate stealing. And it creates something in your head called a conscience. <laughs> if everybody in the country really truly believes this, you can maintain complete order, safety, security for property, women can go anywhere and feel safe without any police. Take the power of the king, separate it in the hands of the people. It's chaos. Unless they're taught the law, what motivates them to follow the law is the God of the Bible. And so Reagan said, without God, there's no virtue because there's no prompting of the conscience. If, there's, if, if, if there is no God, it's just a bunch of rules that some men made up. Why should you follow them? And um, Democrat candidate for president, William Jennings Bryan said, a religion which teaches personal responsibility to God gives strength to morality. There is a powerful restraining influence in the belief that an all-seeing eye scrutinizes every thought and word and act of the individual. Now, it only works with the God of the Bible. An Islamic Allah God says, there's an infidel woman there, nobody's around, you can rape her, it's okay. You can lie to this infidel, steal from that. The God of the Bible says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Be nice to the stranger because you want the stranger in Egypt. So, if you get rid of this God, all you got is a bunch of rules that some men made up. Why follow them? Some will, some won't. Oh, some might because, oh, social contract or whatever. But others are going to say, forget this, and they're going to start lying and stealing and smashing windows and killing classmates and ambushing policemen and setting things on fire. And it's going to turn this lawless mob where everybody's going to feel insecure. And then they're all going to say, we need someone to come along with enough power to restore order. And someone comes along and says, okay, I, I'll restore order, but I need all your guns. I need all your freedom. Don't say anything. You're going to defend somebody. And you're going to take away all this stuff. And yeah, they restore order. But when the dust settles, the rubber band will have snapped from the people ruling themselves bottom up back to a king ruling from the top down. So what happened with ancient Israel? Their system worked for 400 years, but it was dependent on the priests teaching the law to every brand new generation. Right? Every kid is born with this selfish fallen nature. It's almost like, imagine every computer you buy is preloaded with a virus. <laughs> 
and you have to immediately take the computer to the Geek Squad desk and say, clean it off. Every kid is born preloaded with this virus of selfishness. And the Israelites would take the kid to the Levites and say, recode this kid. And the Levite would set the kid down and say, okay, kid, you want to steal, don't steal. You want to lie, don't lie. You want to commit adultery, don't commit adultery. God is watching. He's going to hold you accountable in the future. It worked as long as the priest taught it to every new generation. When the priest stopped teaching the law, it all fell apart. You said, did they? Yeah, here's Eli, the high priest, the main guy that's supposed to teach it. His own sons are sleeping with women in the tent of meeting. The Ark of the Covenant. And, there's, right? and then there's a story of a Levite with a silver graven image in the house of a guy named Micah. And the tribe of Dan comes along and steals the graven image and has his Levite come along and says, hey, you can be a priest for our whole tribe. And you're reading the story, scratching your head, thinking, what's this Levite doing with a silver graven image? Isn't that one of the commandments? You're not supposed to have them. He's not following the law. And then this terrible story of a Levite with a concubine. The law says the Levite is to marry a virgin of his own tribe. Here he is with a woman he's not even married to. He's not following the law. They're traveling and they're to town surrounded by sodomites to bang on the door. Something about that behavior that appears at the very last stages of a people ruling themselves. This casting off of self-restraint and abandonment to passion. They bang on the doors. The poor girl gets raped and dies. And by the time you're grossed out with a story, you read this line, every man did that which was right in their own eyes. Why? Because the priests had stopped teaching them what was right in the Lord's eyes. They lost this consciousness and fear of God. They were no longer taught the law. They gave into their selfish human passions. It's like going fishing and you got the bobber on the fishing line that has a lead weight, right? And you have it dangling above the bottom of the lake. But if you take that bobber off, that lead weight's going to hit the bottom. It's going to get stuck in all the weeds down there. So, so every man does what's right in their own eyes, right? You can feel like a girl today, boy tomorrow, whatever you want, just for whatever you feel, just all, anything goes. Out of that confusion, they go to Samuel the prophet and they say, this isn't working anymore. We want a king. And Samuel cries and the Lord tells him, they did not reject thee. They rejected me that I should not reign over them. God's original plan for Israel was to not have a king, have everybody be equal, everybody own private property, everybody be blessed, and the priest teaching them the system. And so uh, Samuel says, okay, you're going to get a king, but he's going to take away your best land, give it to his favorites, wealth redistribution. He's going to take your daughters, make them be cooks, make your sons run before his chariots. He's going to determine the fate of your kids' lives. We don't care. We want them anyway. And now this is an interesting story. So Saul is pouting that his son Jonathan made a league with David. And he says, none of you soldiers care about poor little me. And a guy named Doeg the Edomite says, King, I care about you. I saw David go to the city of Nob. The priests gave him some bread and the sword of Goliath. Saul says, bring those priests here. Turn to his men, says, kill them. The men hesitate. Doeg says, I'll kill them. Goes out there and kills them all. What just happened? The soldiers, the soldiers were operating under the old system where every person is accountable to God to follow the law. The law says you need two or more witnesses before you condemn somebody to death. There's only one witness, Doeg. They're hesitating. They still have a conscience. They're like, what you says doesn't compute. Uh, you're telling us to do something. There's only one witness. We're accountable to God. Doeg says, King, I'm going to surrender my conscience to you. You tell me to kill, I'll kill. You tell me to kill babies, I'll kill babies. You tell me to do it, I'll just do whatever the government tells me. I'm going to surrender my conscience to the government. So we go through these 6,000 years of history. We see the most powerful form of common form of government. A king keeps getting bigger and bigger. Ancient Israel was the only, the first example of a people ruling themselves without a king, but it didn't last all that long. But the most king, king of England was the most powerful king on the planet. Um, America was founded, decided to break away, take the power of a king and flip it and make the people the king. But there was this still, they felt this rubber band of pointing to pull power together. And so they say, you know what? We're going to separate the power of the king into three branches and pit them against each other. We're going to separate the power of a king federal to state level. We're going to tie this federal government up with 10 handcuffs. We call the first 10 amendments. Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion, free exercise thereof. Congress shall not take away the freedom of press, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, freedom of right to possess and bear arms. Congress shall not, Congress shall not. These were handcuffs on the federal government. And so, this was the experiment in America. We take the power of the king, we separate it into the hands of the people. So who is the king in America? 
Signer of the Constitution, Governor Morris, said, the magistrate is not the king, the people are the king. Chief Justice John Jay, the people are the sovereign of this country. Signer of the Constitution, James Wilson, sovereignty resides in the people. They have not parted with it. Abraham Lincoln, the people of these United States are the rightful masters of both Congresses and courts. I love this Grover Cleveland quote. The sovereignty of 60 millions of free people is the working out of the divine right of man to govern himself, a manifestation of God's plan concerning the human race. So who's the king in America? We are. <laughs> We're the king. The word citizen is Greek. It means co-king. Right? Kings have subjects who are subjected to their will. Democracies and republics have citizens. The word citizen means co-king. Right? Now, a democracy is every citizen has to be there every day to talk politics. There were 6,000 citizens of Athens. Every day they went down to the market and talked politics. If you don't show up for a couple of days, you don't know what's going on, they call you an idiotus. A republic is where you take care of your family and your farm and you have someone in your place that goes to the market every day. They're called your representatives. But you're the king either way. So imagine visiting a king, maybe in the Old Testament. You're going through the streets of Jerusalem and you're witnessing murder, rape, and crime, terrible stuff, and you get into the king's chamber and he looks up at you and he says, did you see all that crime coming in here? I wish somebody would fix it. And you like reach over, tap him on the shoulder, say, excuse me, you're the king. This is your kingdom. I think you're the one accountable to God to fix this mess. That's like somebody in America watching TV, seeing all the terrible stuff going on, saying, I wish somebody would fix this mess. Hello, have a finger reach through the TV tube and tap you on the shoulder. You're the king. You're the one accountable to God to fix this mess. Well, I, I need somebody to tell me what to do. Since when does the king sit on his throne and say, can somebody tell me what I'm supposed to do here? Hey, hey, butler, cook, come here, t tell me, what am I supposed to do? No, it's your job to get educated on the issues Seek God's will, and you tell your representatives what needs to happen. You're the king. God will give you all kinds of ideas on how to do things to make an impact. Every citizen, every congregation member has to be a part. James Wilson said, every citizen forms a part of the sovereign power. He possesses a vote. John Jay, the first Chief Justice, Americans are the first people whom heaven has favored with an opportunity of choosing the forms of government under which they should live. All other constitutions have derived their existence from violence or accidental circumstances. Your lives, your liberty, your property will be at the disposal only of your creator and yourselves. If I were to sum up the greatness of America, it's this quote right here. Your lives, your liberty, your property are at the disposal of your creator and yourself. There's no king in between you and all your stuff. It's just you and your creator. You decide what you want to do with your life, where you want to live, what career path you want to take, who you want to marry, what clothes you want to wear, right? You're not forced to wear a burqa or whatever. You decide. Reagan put it this way. In this country of ours took place the greatest revolution that has ever taken place in the world's history. Every other revolution simply exchanged one set of rulers for another. Here, for the first time in all the thousands of years of man's relation to man, how many thousand, maybe six? The founding fathers established the idea that you and I had within ourselves the God-given right and ability to determine our own destiny. That's what our founding fathers gave us. That's what George Washington gave us. For all of their human failings, they gave us a form of government where you get to be the king of your life, right? So, and together we're all co-kings of America. We pledge allegiance to the flag and to the republic. A republic is where the people are king ruling through representatives. So we're basically pledging allegiance to us being in charge of ourselves, right? And so when, when somebody protests the flag, what they're saying is, I don't want to be the king anymore. I protest this system where I participate in ruling. It's like, okay, dude, <laughs> somebody else will rule your life. So in America, you get to be the king of your life. And um, you have the opportunity of willingly submitting your life to Jesus, the king of kings. People say, well, Jesus is the king of America. He's only the king of America by the citizens of America individually surrendering their life to him.
So you get to be the king of your life and you get to surrender. So uh, Revelation 1, 6, Jesus washed us from our sins and has made us kings and priests unto God. So he says we're kings. And so we're all kings. He's the king of kings. And we voluntarily get to cast our throne, our crowns at his throne, and we get to surrender our lives to him. So it says in Psalms, um, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. So it's not some king coming saying, you got to be afraid of me or I'm going to chop your head off. No, it's a willing thing that we voluntarily surrender our lives to him, but we voluntarily get to submit. And if the whole country does, then he gets to be the king of kings that way. Now, the last point of my talk, it says, if the people are the king, who are the counselors to the king? 379 AD, the Roman Empire's Christian. Remember Constantine, 313 AD, stops the persecution. And then Christianity eventually becomes the official religion. And so here you have a Christian Roman emperor named Theodosius. And he's going to church in Milan, Italy. And the pastor is St. Ambrose, Bishop Ambrose. Could you imagine being Ambrose and having the emperor in your church on Sunday? Guess what? That's exactly what we have in America. Pew Forum that does surveys says that 70% of Americans identify themselves as Christian. Used to be higher, but it's still a majority. 70% of Americans identify themselves as Christian. That means they go to church, at least every now and then, which makes the pastors in America counselors to the king. Instead of it being one emperor, Theodosius, the people are the king. 70% of the people are Christian. And so the pastor has the king in his pew every Sunday. And you have two kinds of pastors. One tells the king to go to sleep, and the other tells the king to wake up. Now, I was watching the movie The Lord of the Rings, and this scene stuck out. There's a scene of a King Theodon. He's the king, but he has a spell cast on him. He's got gray hair, gray eyes, cataracts. He's all crunched up in his throne. And he has two counselors in this scene. One is this greasy guy named Wormtongue that's telling the king, stay asleep. Don't get involved. Yeah, your kingdom's being overrun and it's going down the tubes, but just sleep a little longer and it's all going to be over. And then there's another counselor to the king named Gandalf, and he like comes in and casts the devil out of the king. And the king wakes up. And right before his eyes, he looks around the room and says, dark have been my dreams of late. It's like, yeah, you've been out of it with a spell cast on you for generations telling you not to get involved. And so he says, maybe you'll remember your strength if you take your sword. And so the pastor's job is to wake up the king. So again, you have two type of pastors. One tells the king to go to sleep and shirk your responsibility. Another throws ice water on his congregation and says, you don't just have the right to vote in America. You will be held accountable to God for what happens in America. If they're teaching stuff to little kids that Jesus wouldn't teach, Jesus says, if you allow one of these little ones that believes me to stumble better than a millstone be put around your neck. Jesus taught that in the beginning, God made them male and female. And they try to guilt trip you. If you're really Christian, you let them teach this agenda. It's like, would Jesus teach that? Right? And um, so you are blessed here to have Pastor Rob because he is the type of pastor that's waking you up, saying, hey, you can be involved. You need to be involved. This is your turn out of the 6,000 years of world history. God chose for you to be alive right here. You're not born in some Chinese uh, dictatorship or Iran or uh, the, the you know, sultans or uh, Turkey or whatever. You're born in America where our founders gave us this form of government that was drawn from the Bible of the people getting a chance to be involved and determine what's going on, the bottom-up form of government. So, we will all agree that the most important thing is to bring people to Christ. But the second most important thing is to preserve the freedom to do the most important thing. Because if Sharia law, Islam takes over, like in Pakistan or Saudi Arabia, it's the death penalty for you to tell somebody about Jesus. You won't be able to witness very long. If you're in North Korea and you're a Christian, you're captured and you're put in a labor camp the rest of your life, right? If you are in Egypt, uh, in Cairo, uh, they have Christians there, they call them garbage people because they eke out a living digging through garbage. In America, if you really convince the gospel's the answer, you will be involved wanting to preserve the freedom to preach the gospel. 
right? There was a case a couple years ago where the mayor of Houston was a lesbian, and she wanted to censor all the sermons of all the pastors in Houston. Could you imagine? It's no different than King George III in his star chamber. Wanted to tell you what you can preach and what you can't preach. And it came this close, uh, right? And so there's this push that if we don't get involved, the other side is chomping at the bits to persecute the way that they are persecuting right now in these other countries. So if you're really convinced the gospel is the answer, you're going to be involved wanting to preserve the freedom to preach the gospel. And uh, Martin Luther King Jr. said the same thing. He was upset because there was a whole bunch of church people. Oh, we're not going to get involved because of, you know, 501c3 and everything. He's like, no, there's, there's injustice, racial injustice that's going on. And you should be involved. He says the church is the conscience of the state. It's supposed to be addressing every single issue. Now, in closing, it's in times of crises that people turn to Christ. How many of you tend to come to the Lord when everything's perfect? How many, how many of you, it's when there's a crisis bigger than you can handle? Debt, divorce, discouragement, discouragement, depression, you're flat on your back, right? Do we pray more when things are going good or when they're not? We should pray all the time the same, but all the country is is a whole bunch of individuals. And so the same crisis that maybe causes an, us individually to turn to the Lord, God may let a lot of people have a crisis, a simultaneous one. And what's the purpose of it? The purpose is he wants to draw people to you. God loves you. He wants you to love him back. He doesn't need your love any more than parents don't need their kids to love them, but they want the kids to love them. So God loves us. He wants us to love him back, but love by definition must be voluntary. The moment it's forced, it evaporates. It's like a, if a husband twists his wife's arm and says, tell me you love me. No matter what she says, she doesn't love him. But if he woos her and courts her and defends her and protects her and provides for her and takes her to dinner and gives her flowers and chocolate and out of the abundance of her heart, it bubbles up, I love you, then it means something. That's what God's after. He's not after submit or I chop your head off. If he wanted to make us obey, he could have. But he wanted us to be involved and to, to love him. So in crisis, sorry for getting a little preachy there. In crisis, people turn to Christ. But it's also in times of crises that leaders are raised up. The point I was going to get at is God has plan A and plan B. Plan A is he blesses us so much we turn to him and love him voluntarily, right? If that doesn't work, there's plan B. He withholds the blessings and we turn to him out of desperation. So he wants us to turn to him. And so when things get bad, it's not because he wants to punish. He wants us to turn to him and he turns the heat up a little bit. And more people turn. He turns up the heat a little bit more. More people turn. So finally, nobody else is going to turn. And he turns up the whole thing and he fries what's left. <laughs> and that's for the book of Revelation. And I'll, I'll leave that up for somebody else to preach on. So last verse, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. So if you are really a good person, you will want to leave a country with the same freedoms that you inherited. The same freedom so that they can walk down the street and feel safe that they can be able to share their faith in a public school without being persecuted, that they can, you know, marry who they want to marry and take the job that they want to have. So that's my talk, and I'm going to turn it back over to Pastor. God bless you. Thank you so much.